Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming and joining us for Be a Digital Ally. Um, I am Jay McKay, Director of Community Programs, and we welcome you to another monthly edition of um, what is becoming our favorite part of the month, to be honest. We've been having a great time doing these. Um, so you are here for Be a Digital Ally, Visual Information Part 1. Um, as we were building it, we realized there was too much to put into one month, so we'll, we'll break it up into two. Um, oh, there it goes. Um, so for our slides today, if you want to follow along, it is going to be um, a bit.ly link. So it's going to be bit.ly slash vizinfo and the number one. So it'll be a capital V as in Victor. Uh, so it'll be B-I-S and then info with a capital I and then just the number one. And then Molly or um, Eric, if somebody can put that in the chat for me as well. Okay. So thank you all, of course. Um, if you have been joining us from month to month, we thank you as always. If you are watching this as a recorded session, I'm just going to give you uh, a little heads up because we want to make sure that we value your time as well. Um, a lot of this little first intro part may look very familiar um, and feel free to skip forward if you need to. Um, for those that have been here with us before, if you need to go run and grab that snack, that's lovely too. Uh, but we just want to make sure for all our new um, participants and visitors um, that we've kind of got everybody on the, the same playing field. So we just, we're going to do this little intro every, every time. So but we thank you for letting us be a part of your journey. Uh, and at Be a Digital Ally, we always strive to create an inclusive and accessible spaces. And part of that is uh, providing that background knowledge and kind of providing that rev up. So these, you know, 10 minute intros that are very, very familiar, it's to make sure again, everybody's on the same page. Uh, of course, we wanna make sure we are kind and polite and ref respectful to everybody. So that includes um, in the chat, in the comments, and then ensuring accessibility. Um, so that includes um, the materials that we provide, any additional accommodations. Um, so we have the live captioning through Zoom available uh, for any of you that need to attend next time and you're like, hey, I really need to have live captioning or hey, these Google Slides aren't working for me. Can I have it as a PDF or as a PowerPoint? Just let us know and, and we'll make sure we, we get that taken care of for you. All right, so we're just gonna do some quick introductions um, and let you get to know the staff here. So of course, I am Jay McKay, as I said before, Director of Community Programs. Um, I am a white female in her 40s. I've got short brown hair, I'm wearing glasses, and right now today I'm sporting my big gaming headphones. So take it away, Molly. Great, um, and I am Molly Moore. Hi, everyone. Um, I am a community engagement specialist at Nobility. Um, I'm a white female in her mid 30s uh, with blonde hair, and I will pass it to Erica. Hi, I'm Erica Braverman. I am um, a co Molly, and I engage the community together as community engagement specialists, but I also run our Access Works usability testing program. Um, and I am also a, a white woman in my mid thirties. I have brown hair, which is an abundant day. I'm wearing glasses and big blue and white earrings. And I will pass it on to Seska. Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Francesca Castleton. I am the accessibility analyst over here at Nobility. I help audit websites. Um, I am Asian in my mid thirties and female. Right. Okay. Oh, there's my thing. Um, so just a little bit about Nobility. We were founded in 1999. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we're based locally, technically in Austin, Texas, but really we operate globally. Um, you know, we were coast to coast, really. We have people on both ends and in the middle and everywhere in between. So, uh, and of course our mission is to create an inclusive digital world for people with disabilities. And so what the, the way that we really do that is through education, awareness, and advocacy. Um, and so these are just a few of the community programs that we do um, to further that mission of you know, bringing education, awareness, and advocacy. So that includes AIR, which is our uh, accessibility internet rally, which is currently up and running in terms of um, registrations. So uh, we do encourage you if you're interested in joining a team or if you are a um, 
a nonprofit organization yourself and you're looking to be a part of it, maybe you also or a community org uh, and you want to know more about AIR, please check it out. We just wrapped up our Access U, which was our big annual um, tech conference. So that's why you didn't see us uh, for the month of May. Uh, Access Works is our usability testing program. And then we have our K-12 digital accessibility, which um, is several different pieces, one of which is our K-12 access summit, um, which is, um, we're really excited. It's our annual K-12 virtual conference, and I'll actually have a slide at the end about that. So, uh, but really we do all of this through donations and support. So um, if you wanna throw us a, a couple extra bucks, we do greatly appreciate it. Every little bit helps. You can do that by going to nobility.org slash donate, or if you are interested in sponsoring any of our events, uh, we do encourage you to email our um, development director at sponsorship at nobility.org. All right, so you're here for Be a Digital Ally. It is a monthly series with the goal of covering basic skills to get you started in accessible web design or digital design. Um, and really just make sure that content is accessible to people with disabilities. Um, so you may be a content creator of any skill uh, or you are new to accessibility. So I always um, give the example, you are the person that um, got nominated as your community org's um, social media director because you're the person who has has their own Facebook account, or you could be somebody who is doing web design, uh, but now you're just kind of looking at it from the perspective of accessibility. So our learning objectives today are just kind of a, a rundown of what we're doing. Um, so we're going to just do, again, a quick overview of what accessibility is and assistive technology for those that may not be familiar. Uh, we're going to also talk about what we mean by the word visual information, um, and then also talk about um, audio description, as well as good tips for visual description, um, practice, and then of course questions at the end. And we did get some questions in um, our email, so we'll make sure that we address those as well. All right, so when we talk about accessibility, what are we actually talking about? What does that mean? So um, I have a definition here that I have um, fused together, so to speak, from our friends at w3.org and from the AIM Center, which is out of CAST. Um, and so for something to be accessible, it's not just, is it available? Can I get to it, right? Is it on the shelf and I can grab it? Um, for something to be accessible, and especially when we're talking about digital accessibility, for it to be accessible, people need to be able to perceive it. Can they hear it? Can they see the content? Um, understand. Do they know where they're supposed to go, um, what they're supposed to do, or what to expect, right? So do I know how to get to the link I need? Do I know that I'm supposed to find a link? And do I know what happens when I click that link? Uh, navigate. Can they independently navigate using their preferred tools? So if I need to get to a specific link uh, and I can't use a standard mouse, um, am I able to do that with some kind of eye gaze system? Am I able to do that with a keyboarding system? Um, interact, can they independently complete those tasks and explore all the areas, right? So again, we want them to be able to see your whole site, engage with it fully. And then lastly is contribute. Can they fully participate in an authentic manner? So if somebody is not able to um, navigate, interact or understand, or even um, know that that content's there, um, they're not gonna be able to par participate um, and fully engage. Um, and be able to communicate or see when that next event's happening or find a way to volunteer. So we wanna make sure um, all of those things are covered in accessibility. So why is it important to design for it? Uh, so 15% of the world's population lives with some form of disability and several people may not actually consider themselves to be disabled as it's defined by who. Uh, so this could be some people who um, are using hearing aid devices as they age, but they don't necessarily consider themselves disabled. Uh, but under the, the World Health Organization's definition, they would be considered disabled. Uh, but also really a, a, another or one of the, the reasons a lot of people don't think about accessibility is how many people actually benefit that don't necessarily even have a disability at all, right? Think about captions. How many of us are using captions when we are um, streaming content? How many of us um, 
you know, prefer to have the doors that automatically open instead of um, having to push them, right? So all of these things really do benefit us. All right, so in talking about um, visual information and audio descriptions, uh, we saw some really good information and stats came that um, came from 3Play Media. Uh, so there's an estimated 82% of the world's internet traffic is video, and that's a percentage that's growing. Okay, so more and more content and more and more stuff that people are engaging with is video. So we need to make sure that's accessible. Also, research is showing that 20 to 30% of students say they retain information through sound, okay? That's actually not a lot. That's less than half of students um, are just taking in information auditorily. So they really are seeking that visual input um, or getting something that's um, of a more visual um, content. And then over 285 million people globally have some form of vision loss while 39 million people are blind. So there's a lot of visual content, um, people are asking for it, but then also we have a large percent of people that aren't necessarily going to perceive it as just strictly visual content. So in talking about that, we also want to look at assistive technology. So these are two um, definitions, and I won't read them out completely because you'll have access to the slides, but this first one from the world or uh, from uh, ATIA is that AT is any item or piece of equipment, software program, or product system um, that is used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of a person with a disability. Um, so again, it could be um, a raised surface, it could be lined paper, it could be uh, just my standard phone, but now I'm using voiceover on it. Okay, so all of these different things can be assistive technology. And um, the World Health Organization has added some components to that, but they're really, especially this last line I like, um, the primary purpose of these products is to maintain or improve the individual's functioning and independence, thereby promoting their well-being. So really it's that idea of um, independence and, and overall well-being, right? It's that quality of life. All right, so just a couple of examples of assistive technology, and we'll talk a little bit more about them later on in the slides, but things like screen readers, refreshable braille, uh, alternative navigation methods like keyboards or switches. Um, a lot of people can't use a mouse. A lot of people can't just touch things on their phone. Um, so how are they going to get to those apps? How are they going to get to those links on your site? Closed captions, we already talked about, transcripts, uh, magnification, just to zoom things in can be considered assistive technology. And then dark mode or high contrast. We also provided the web aim examples. Um, these are great. They actually have um, some more in-depth pictures and descriptions. I think there's actually a couple of videos with them as well. So as we start our journey this evening into visual information, uh, we always want to remember this quote because um, for a lot of people, accessibility, they feel like they're afraid to do something wrong. And so they feel like it's better not to do anything because then that way you don't make the mistake. Uh, but really that's, that's not the way we want you to think about it. The idea is to do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, you do better. And this is a quote that comes from uh, Maya Angelou. So this is always one that's in my head. Um, I'm gonna do what I can until somebody tells me a better way to do it. And then I'm gonna take that knowledge and move even more forward in my accessibility journey. So uh, we're excited. I hope you are too. Take it away, Seska. Cool, thank you, Jay. All right, introduction to visual information. You can go on next slide. All right, assistive technology is technology that helps accommodate an individual who may have functional limitations. So who benefits from, from all of this? Well, lots of people, people with disabilities, the elderly, people with non-communicable diseases such as diabetes and stroke, people with mental health conditions, including dementia and autism, and people with gradual functional decline. So at the end of the day, accessibility is really, it's a benefit for everyone. And there are different types of assistive technology which help the blind or visually impaired users. 
We have screen magnification. This allows visually impaired users to increase the size of text or increase the size of an image. Screen readers allows blind or visually impaired users to read the text that is dis displayed on the computer screen. And then we also have braille embossers. And so braille is a system of raised dots that can be read with the fingers by people who are blind or who have low vision. So many times when I'm on my phone, I'll be scrolling through it and the text or images might appear very small for me. So I'll just zoom in to view the content. I also had a friend who would use a screen reader uh, while they were si simultaneously doing other tasks. Very beneficial. So how to get the most out of these assistive technologies? So we're gonna dive into discussing different types of images. So our first one, we have informative images. These are images that graphically represent concepts and information, typically pictures, photos, and illustrations. The text alternative should be at least a short description conveying the essential information presented by the image. So in this example, um, we have an image or an icon to signify to the user that whether or not it is a phone or a fax number. So a lot of times while I am auditing websites, I often find that these are forgotten. So if as long as you provide an alternative text to the graphic or icon, then you can inform the user what that phone, uh, what which phone numbers <laughs> these correspond to. For our next one, we got decorative images. For decorative images, you can provide a null text alternative. So this is just an empty alt tag. Um, this is when the only purpose of an image is to add visual decoration to the page rather than to convey information that is important to understanding the page. Um, so in this example, um, say for example, you were visiting a website about dog walking. It might have a picture of a dog. Um, and wh while this might be um, visually as aesthetic, it's not necessary or useful for the screen reader to announce. So the, the goal here is not to overwhelm the user with verbose language. And this can be debatable. Um, I had a colleague who is visually impaired who preferred to know what the image was, even if it wasn't informative. They just wanted to be able to know everything that was on the page. So it's not wrong to add an alt text to all of your images. I think at the end of the day, it's better to provide accessibility versus none at all. Um, but also, if you're unsure whether or not an image should have alt text, um, W3 has a helpful tutorial um, that is an alt decision, decision tree. <laughs> and I provided that link right there on the slide. All right, so our next one, we have functional images. The text alternative of an image that used as a link or as a button should describe the functionality of the link or button rather than the visual image. So um, in case you're wondering here, this I think this is a great example. So if you have a search input with an icon that is a button that has a magnifying glass, you don't want the alternative text on that magnifying glass image to be magnifying glass. You want, if it's functional, you want to be able to inform the user what this button is actually doing. So the purpose of this button, you may want to put submit search or even just search. And for our next one, we have text images. This is readable text is sometimes presented within an image. If the image is not a logo, avoid text and images. However, if images of text are used, the text alternative should contain the same words as the image. So in this example, you'll see that it's an image of text without using HTML and CSS. This was just graphically illustrated. Um, whenever possible, try to use HTML and CSS when creating images with text, because when users zoom in on an image, the image will tend to become pixelated or it will be hard to read. So whenever possible. 
just try your best. <laughs> For this next one, um, complex images such as graphs and diagrams. They convey data or detailed information, provide a complete text equivalent of the data or information provided in the image as the text alternative. So here we have a bar chart of website visitor statistics, mm -hmm. and the short description is provided in the alt text. You can also put a link under the diagram or graph, um, linking it to plain text that has a more in-depth explanation of what data is in the graph or diagram. Here we have groups of images. If multiple images convey a single piece of information, the text alternative for one image should convey the information for the entire group. So what's going on here is um, I got this picture off Yelp. They have a four out of five star rating. So instead of adding an alt text for each of, each of those stars, what you can do um, is for the very, very first star, you provide an alt text that says four out of five stars. And then for the rest of the stars, you can leave null as in an empty alt text or empty alt tag. All right, so why is this important? Images are used extensively on websites, which can create major barriers for the visually impaired, including people with low vision. Images and graphics make content easier to understand and serve as cues that are used to help orient users within the content. So for this reason, it's very important to make sure that all images are accessible. So next we have creating accessible videos. So for videos, to be able to perceive audio, you need hearing. To see a video, you need vision. Audio and video, you need hearing and vision. In order to make videos perceptible to all audiences, you need an alternative for both the audio and visual elements. Some people who are blind or have low vision are unable to see videos well or at all. They use descriptions of visual information in order to understand what is going on visually. So it's best to provide captions um, and a separate transcript, as this is helpful for those using a screen reader. Audio and video media. So when, when making these, um, these are a couple of important points. You'll want to use low background audio speak clearly and slowly, pause between topics so that you can give people time to process the information, use clear language, so you wanna avoid using acronyms or jargon, and integrate description into the main audio content. Uh, and here we have autoplay videos. So on an important note, don't use them on your website. The audio that automatically starts playing completely obscures the speech of the screen reader, rendering the page inaccessible. Autoplay videos can distract visitors from finding the content that they need, and they also take up bandwidth that your visitors might not have in their connection. So oftentimes, if a video automatically starts playing, the site might load extremely slow, which also causes bounce rate. So don't, don't use autoplay videos. Descriptive transcripts. Um, these are needed for most videos to be accessible to people who are deaf and blind. They meet a wide range of accessibility needs, including people who have difficulty processing auditory information and people who cannot focus or comprehend auditory or visual information when there is changing visuals. It's also used by people without disabilities. Easy and inexpensive to develop using captions and description. And the great thing is, is once captions and transcripts are um, use the same text. So once you have one, it's fairly easy to develop the other. So in this next slide, I have 
an example of audio described um, in a snippet of The Lion King. And so you'll get an idea for how this works, how it's more descriptive. And we'll, we'll go ahead and play this for you. <laughs> Hundreds of animals gather at the bottom of Pride Rock, a tall, flat ledge that towers over the rest of the savanna. Zazu, a small blue bird with a large beak, flaps to the ledge. He bows to Mufasa, a powerful, dignified lion with a thick red mane. Rafiki, an elderly baboon with white hair, slowly climbs up to the ledge and hugs Mufasa warmly. They walk back to a cave where Mufasa's wife, Sarabi, cuddles a tiny lion cub in her paws. Smiling, Rafiki bends over Simba, the baby lion, and shakes his walking stick, which has two melons tied to it. Simba swats his paws at the melons playfully. Rafiki breaks one open. The wise old baboon dips his thumb in its juice and draws a line on Simba's forehead. Then he takes a handful of sand and sprinkles it over him. Simba's parents, Mufasa and Sarabi, smile and lean their heads together. Rafiki, who is much smaller than the adult lions, takes Simba up in his arms. Carrying him like a baby, he walks slowly to the end of the ledge, then holds Simba high in the air for all the animals to see. Perfect. I remember the first time I watched an audio described video. Um, <laughs> I forgot what was the purpose of why I was watching it because I was so absorbed into the descriptions. <laughs> but, but yes, um, we are going to dive more into audio descriptions and Molly is going to take us through that. Go ahead, Molly. Yeah, thanks, Suska. Um, so we're gonna do a deep dive on audio description now. Um, uh, as Suska mentioned, um, audio description is the track that uh, tells um, people who are not taking in the visual information, what visual information they're missing on the screen. Um, it's often used for blind or low vision users. Um, typically, people will insert it into the natural pauses in a video, um, like we just saw with the Lion King clip. Um, and similar to closed captions, you'll know if something has audio description track available um, by this AB symbol. Um, that looks very similar to that CC um, closed caption symbol. Um, so yeah, that will let you know like on Netflix or YouTube if you are able to add uh, audio description to what you're watching. And we do have another example here. Um, so I think just pay attention to the language used in this and uh, we'll talk about it. In a logo. Stars twinkle in the sky. Our view drifts down through clouds to a river that winds past hillsides. A train crosses a bridge. As a flag waves on the top of a castle's tallest spire, a bright display of fireworks explodes in the sky. A glowing pinpoint of light arcs over the castle, leaving a trail of sparkling dust. Words appear. Disney. Yeah, so I really like that example because um, the flow of it is really great. Um, the narrator describes everything that they're seeing as they see it, and they use really precise, specific language that's extremely descriptive um, and active. So I just think that's a great example of um, audio description. So let's dive into a little bit of the history of how audio description came to be um, used. <laughs> or, so in 1980, um, the media programming group of WGBH-TV, who was also really instrumental in uh, creating closed captioning, um, cr 
created something called an SAP, which is a second audio programming or second audio program um, as a way to deliver audio description over broadcast TV. Um, so that would just be the track data add-on um, to uh, transmit the audio description. Um, in 1990, theaters began um, implementing audio description through the use of headsets. Um, the production company Theater Vision was one of the first uh, companies to do this. And Forrest Gump, fun fact, was one of the first films to use this service. Um, so they really got that idea from museums, which had been using um, audio devices for a while and headphones to deliver, you know, content about the uh, art as well as just description of the art. <clears throat> In 1998, Congress added Section 508 to the Rehabilitation Act of 1978, which required federal agencies to make everything that was electronic and information um, accessible to people with disabilities. So all videos that are put out through the government or through the federal agencies um, must have audio description included. And in 2015, um, Netflix announced that Daredevil would be their first movie to offer an audio description track which was good marketing for them because uh, Daredevil was, um, is blind. Um, so they uh, kind of made it a big celebration of the fact that they were starting to do audio description, but it also had to do with, um, we'll move to the next slide. <clears throat> um, in 2010, so it is in the law as well that they needed to start doing this. Um, <clears throat> the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act CBAA was passed by Obama. Um, its goal was to phase in audio description um, requirements uh, between 2010 and 2020. Uh oh, <laughs> I think this happened exactly the same spot last time for me. <laughs> um, and in 2020, that proposal was, or there was a proposal submitted to expand. Um, those uh, description regulations by phasing them in to new markets each year for four years, because as you noticed, we are past 2020 and not everything is audio description, but this is where a lot of the streaming services um, have uh, gotten the push to um, start implementing audio description. Um, and then we have the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, um, WCAG. So AAA is the gold standard for accessibility, um, but AA is what's necessary to be considered accessible. And um, audio description is required for WCAG 2.0 level AA for pre-recorded synchronized video media. So if you want to meet um, accessibility requirements, you do want to include audio description in any video um, that you put out. Um, so now we'll talk about a few different ways to deliver that audio description. Um, we have live video description, audio description, which is what we're doing now. Um, it's often, you know, you'll see this if you're doing a presentation, um, either recorded or not recorded, you're describing any visual elements as you go. So anything that is on your screen or on your slides, you'll go ahead and uh, include a description. That means you won't have to go back and re-record an audio track later. Um, <clears throat> so you'll already have your audio description included in your video um, and you can go ahead and just put that out. Um, it also gives your live audience the benefit of audio description. Um, so if you have a blind or visually impaired um, audience members or you have audience members who aren't looking at their screen for whatever reason, they get that benefit as well. Um, <clears throat> and then also what's cool is uh, live audio description can be um, used in live performances like at a play or um, at a movie. Um, our good friends at ArtSpark uh, are really great at this. Um, and uh, yeah, it's cool to see an audio described play if you haven't gotten the chance. Um, the second option is recorded audio description, and that is that second audio program we talked about earlier, um, which really got the ball moving on what audio description might look like. 
Um, <clears throat> if you have recording equipment at home or at your office, you can write out a, a script for your audio description and record it while you're watching your video content. You wanna do that so it's very matched up with um, the timings of your video. Um, you can then merge that track with your source audio and um, put out a second video that includes that um, audio description track. And now we'll talk about different types of audio description um, that you will, you know, you will use. There's standard audio description, which means like the Lion King uh, video and um, the Disney logo video. <clears throat> that audio description is able to fit into the natural breaks of narration. Um, they didn't have to pause the video to fit more in. They just set it exactly as the uh, video is recording. For extended audio description, you will need to pause the video um, in order to insert that audio description. And this is helpful if you have a video with a lot of dialogue, um, but you have some important visual elements that you need to get across. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that second audio program. Um, so basically, yeah, it's that auxiliary audio program for analog television um, that can be broadcast over the air and now through cable. Um, it's the way uh, you can get audio description and programming in another language um, on your TV, on live TV. Um, <clears throat> and that 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act that we mentioned a little while ago has um, made it so all TV and cable networks must provide a quota of audio described programming. So they need to provide at least a certain amount of um, audio described programs, which they keep track of with those SAPs. Okay. And then um, you can have a text only audio description. Um, so you will always want to, uh, if you're creating your audio description after the fact or you're adding audio description to a video, you will want to write out a script because the timing is really important. But you can just provide a audio just like I think we had a question in the chat. Um, yeah, so that's a descriptive transcript would include these descriptions along with the captions. Um, so it is a little different. <clears throat> um, You'll want to include the timings so your audience members can follow along and make sure all the details are lining up with what's going on at that time on the screen. Um, but it doesn't offer quite as much accommodation as an audio track. So, you know, always, um, if you can, go with audio description. Um, best practice is really to provide both. And then finally, you can outsource your audio description. Um, a lot of times, I mean, yeah, you might be running short on time and there are uh, many professional description vendors that can go ahead and do that for you. We've listed a few here and I just wanna point out the audio description project at the bottom. That's a really cool library of um, different audio description vendors and resources. It's not the best, <laughs> most well-designed website, but it does have a lot of really great information. Okay, now we can talk a little bit about um, how to create effective audio description. So um, there are three uh, core skills that go into creating good audio description. Um, first, you want to make sure you are just observing. Um, you are not uh, observing as Molly or as Jay, you are just observing exactly what's going on on the screen. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a minute, but you also want to analyze. You want to pick out why a certain piece of visual information might be more important uh, to the overall message of the video than others. And then finally, you wanna communicate. You wanna use uh, precise language, specific language um, and keep as consistent with the tone as possible. Um, and again, I would recommend looking at that first, that Disney video again, just because they use really great language in that. Okay, so for tip number one, we have describe what you see and that's the observe portion. Um, and that really means that instead 
what you want to do is just watch the video and um, take in exactly what's happening happening visually on the screen. You want to avoid adding anything extra, such as um, information not provided to sighted users. Don't add any fun facts about you know what you're seeing. Um, any lessons, analysis, or conclusions, that's going to be subjective and really not necessary to what's going on at the moment. Um, don't add any context. Um, you wanna just trust that that is uh, self-evident. And then don't add your own opinion or interpretation. Um, yeah, so keep it objective, not subjective. Tip two, prioritize the details you include. So yeah, there's going to be a lot of visual information on the screen and it's a video, so things are moving really fast. You won't be able to include every detail, so you'll need to make choices. Um, you'll really just wanna choose the details that are most important to understanding the content as a whole. Um, so you'll probably, if you're creating a script yourself, you'll want to go ahead and watch the video a few times before you even start doing the audio description because that will make it easier to know, oh, this person will really need to know that those curtains are red. I won't say why that's a spoiler. <laughs> um, and then action, finally action is often more important than setting. So rather than describing that um, it's winter and the Alps, you'll want to describe that there's a train, you know, running off the tracks <laughs> in the Alps. All right. Tip number three. Um, this is a little contradictory. It sounds at first, but it's include everything. That really just means don't censor. Even if the material makes you uncomfortable, that goes back to avoiding any sort of subjective, um, subjective opinion going into your audio description. Um, this is because what might be offensive to you might not be to another person. Um, it also may leave out something really important that the person would need to know to um, kind of get what's going on in that whole video. So um, making editorial choices um, rather than just describing what you see um, makes it more likely that your audience will wind up confused. Um, they hired you to write audio description, not to edit the movie. Um, finally, we are yeah, next we have tip number four, um, use the present tense. So <clears throat> like we saw in both of those clips, they spoke in present tense, what was what exactly was happening on the screen at that time. Um, so yes, you want to reflect exactly what's happening as it's happening. Um, it does confuse your audience if you switch tenses. Um, for instance, if you said uh, Rafiki held Simba, um, instead of hold Simba, you might wonder, when was he holding him? I Maybe I missed that. Um, so just keep it present. Otherwise, you are likely to confuse your audience. And um, use just good plain language rules um, by using active tense and short sentences. Um, so we do have a plain language uh, via digital ally that you can check out on our website. Tip number five is be consistent. Um, so first off, that just means once you've named a character or a place or object, just stick with that name throughout. Um, your audience is already going to have to be juggling a lot of uh, nouns and characters. Um, so take it easy on them and just pick one name to stick with. You know, don't start calling a character Scrooge and then later Ebenezer because they won't know who Ebenezer is. Um, <clears throat> keep your tone. So the second thing it means is a little different. Um, it's keep your tone, word choice, and pasting consistent with the overall tone of the piece. So um, avoid pairing a dramatic video with a chipper voice and vice versa. Um, you don't want your audio description to stick out like a sore thumb. And tip number six is be creative. Um, similar to alt text, uh, there are best practices and guidelines for creating good audio description, but you will still ultimately be the one in charge of what to say. Um, so go wild with, or no, don't go wild, but <laughs> um, try to use uh, a colorful vocabulary. Use precise nouns, descriptive adjectives, and um, 
active verbs to paint as accurate and vivid a description as possible. And that can be really fun. All right, so finally, we do have a little bit of practice. Um, so usually at this point, um, good audio description practice or visual information practice would be to describe what um, the contents of the video we're about to watch would be. But for the purpose of this practice, um, I won't do that. Um, we'll talk about it afterwards, though. Um, so for this practice, if you want to just throw in the chat a few elements you want to be sure to include in your audio description, you don't have to write out a full script, just maybe throw out some things you'd want to communicate to your audience. Squishy! Hey, Squishy! Feel the cheek, Squishy. <laughs> and this is where I would make the joke, like any good scripter of audio description, we should watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not a bad idea. <laughs> um, for, okay. for the sake so we, of time, we'll be, we'll, yeah. we'll keep it to one. And we do already have quite a few like great, um, great suggestions in the chat. Um, so from Carlos, we have hand offering food. That's a great one. Um, Lindsay Foster says squirrel being fed nuts by human hand. JoLynn says squirrel eating out of human hand. Fat cheeks, definitely, very cute. <laughs> um, Kelly says squirrel runs across lawn to man holding nuts. That's great. Um, that uh, could really operate as your um, full description. And Jock says very cute squirrel eats peanuts and shells from a man who talks to the squirrel. And I love that. <laughs> That's also um, accurate and gets the gets the tone across and and i think too like for me when i'm watching it i would think of like every time i would say the next time he grabs a nut like the next the next one so it just kind of gives oh, that yeah. idea of like exactly how many nuts is the squirrel going to get in there and um yeah so we did have a solution or just some suggestions too but again this is a creative this is where you know there's no hard and fast rule everything y'all said was um exactly right so um, the elements I thought were the squirrel, the lawn, the hand, the nuts, and the full cheeks. Um, so the script I wrote was a squirrel runs across a grassy front lawn to a man's open hand, which is full of nuts. The squirrel fills his cheek with the nuts one by one, eventually fitting all of them in his mouth at once. Um, and that's a little long. I mean, I really liked uh, the really brief squirrel runs across land to, uh, lawn to open hand and eats nuts. Um, that also totally gets the point across. Okay, um, so that's it for audio description and I'm going to pass it over to Erica um, for visual description. Thank you, Molly. Um, so we're going to actually in this section, I know that we talked about visual description kind of in the title of our uh, be a digital ally tonight, but I'm bringing us back there because for the rest of our presentation, we're sort of going to be touching on everything that we've been talking about before. We're going to talk about some of the concepts that Jay talked about. We're going to talk about some of the things that Seska talked about and Molly talked about, but we're going to also be taking those items and um, techniques and we're going to practice applying them in some of the more typical scenarios. We're talking about them in the context of more typical scenarios when we might really need to be using visual description sort of in the wild and maybe on our own and, and need some frameworks for that. Uh, so we're going to start out just revisiting this idea. What's the sort of nutshell description of visual description? Uh, visual description is either spoken or written. It's an interpretation of images or a series of images on display. So sometimes it's just one image, sometimes it's more than one. And visual description can include alternative text. Um, it can include the relationship between multiple images. 
between images and text and um, the relationship between images and navigational functions. So there's no one master visual description. It really depends on what the visuals are and what they're doing. So lots of different ways that visual description can exist. And why do we need it? Well, first of all, because this is Be a Digital Ally, because we're nobility, we always love to start with accessibility, uh, which, as you know, is very important. Um, but how exactly does this play out? Why does visual description make these things more accessible? Well, you know, we talked about screen readers, we talked about magnification, and people with no vision or sometimes low vision um, might be using a description to perceive the content of an image or slide. Maybe they have it really magnified in depth, and so a description helps them get the full picture. They could be looking at just one small part of the visual, or they could be using a screen reader and taking everything in via audio or a screen reader and a braille output display. And also, um, people with some types of cognitive disabilities would use a, a written or a verbal description to understand the content of an image. Um, you know, sometimes taking things in visually is not the best way for people to, to get what they need to know. And that ties into the concept of better information in general for everyone. If you get information from a picture and a description together, it can help you understand content much better than you would with an image alone. I remember when I was little and I was learning to knit, um, it always helped me if I got from whichever adult was showing me how to, how to make a particular stitch. It always helped me if, I, if they explained what they were doing as they were showing me, as they were demonstrating. So, I mean, that's a perfect example of, of getting an audio description and a visual together and that being a better experience. And then um, I think we've all been here for this next one. If you're multitasking, you're doing two things at once, you're watching a webinar or a video, you're trying to do something else, and then that webinar becomes a podcast, you're not looking at it anymore, you're just listening. It can be really helpful to get a full description of the slides or whatever the content is. And I, I left this off and I'm very embarrassed that I left this off because I, before I got into accessibility, I was a language teacher. Language learners can also really benefit from a description because it helps them to, to concretize the language. You know, they might have seen a word come up or, or heard a word come up and they're not quite sure of the meaning, but then when it comes up in the description of an image and they see the object, they say, oh, I know, I know what that is. And it helps them cement, okay, so I was right. It is, it is that thing in the picture. It is the, the socket wrench, the, you know, weighing scale, the, you know, um, the judge, the attorney, you know, whatever they're looking at in the picture for that unfamiliar word. And then when do you need visual description? We're going to really today talk about two particular instances of this. Um, the first one is like we are now, in a presentation, slideshow, or a discussion involving visual information. Um, having a visual description of those diagrams, images, or other components of a slide allows participants to, to comprehend all the information, even if they're not using vision. And then this is something that it took me a while to really understand when I started learning about how people use screen readers. Um, you can and you should add alt text to any image in a slideshow. But if you're just perceiving those slides through Zoom, you can't use a screen reader to read the alt text. You can't use a screen reader to read the text on the page. It really is just a picture. And so um, if someone's using a screen reader and they don't have those slides, they really don't have any context without a good description. 
And then the second scenario is on a website or other online resource that contains images. So most websites, also social media, you know, anything like that. So those image descriptions support accessibility. They also support visitors with slow connections. Um, you know, alt text will display even if the picture never loads. So if the alt text is there as a visual description of the image and something goes wrong with the internet, you can still convey what's going on in the picture to people visiting the site. And image descriptions can help improve SEO. Um, obviously, if, if the keywords, this is not a blanket statement, if the keywords are related to the topic of the page, that will bump you up in the results. Um, so it's not necessarily, if you're talking, if the picture is about something completely different than the topic of the site, then um, that that would not necessarily be the case. So if it's on topic, we had some questions about that. So I wanted to, to draw attention to that. Um, but in general, they can help with SEO. All right, so it's late at night and you are working on um, updating your website and you're tired and you wanna finish quickly and you're trying to remember how to visually describe all these photos that you're adding, right? So where do you start? The first thing to do, I recommend, is to think about the type of image it is and its purpose. What is it, why do you have it? And the best way to do that is to go back to those um, types of images that Seska described and look up the best practice for that type of image, right? You don't need to review all of them trying to figure out what it is. Think about which type first and then go read the description for just that one because there's a lot of detail in those tutorials. Um, so once you get there, where does it fit in the categories and then how do you need to set it up? Read the information, take a look at the tutorial. I have a link to those tutorials in, in the slides and I, I really do recommend you check it out. So you've, you've got the idea of what you need to do for the description. You've described the image. And then think about, is there information that you want to share about the image that's not contained within the image itself, right? Alternative text can only express what's in the image. If there's other information you want to share, you have to display it a different way. So that might include the year the image was created. It might be an old photo and you wanna tell people this photo was taken in 1942, but you can't really tell that from the picture. Or you might, if you're showing a piece of artwork, you might wanna have the name of the artist or the materials they used to make it, or maybe a story about something in the image. This is my little race car that I built in second grade, right? And here's a picture of me with my race car, right? Um, but you can't tell that I'm in second grade or I built my race car in school. That is external. If you have information like that, you might wanna think about adding a caption generally below your photo visually as part of your image description. It's describing the image, but it's going beyond the alt text to convey additional information. And those captions will get picked up um, by a screen reader if it's a site that's navigable, or it would be something to share as part of describing a presentation. We're gonna to get to that in a, in a little bit. And then uh, we are going to move on to presentations right now. How about that? All right. so. You finished updating all the photos. And then the next night, you have a, a presentation to put together for some potential donors or customers or you know, some community event. And you're trying to figure out how do I audio describe all these slides? Well, one thing that is key to think about first is that you're gonna need to describe the text on the slide. It needs to be conveyed verbally if you're giving your presentation live, if this is going to be something that people are watching later, 
or maybe you're pre-recording, it's gonna be a recorded slide and it's never gonna be presented live. You need to have audio available to convey the, um, the material, the text on the slide. And that goes back to screen readers will treat a, a Zoom screen share as, as one big picture. So that's why it's so important to share that information verbally. And then images on a slide. And that's all images. That's logos, maps, charts, graphs. All that should be described verbally or via audio um, while you're presenting. Um, so what belongs in the visual description of the slide, right? What, what do we really need to think about um, in more granular terms and nuts and bolts? We've kind of gone big picture. So headings and text, um, that includes, so if I was, you know, as I'm going, for example, I say what belongs in the visual description and then headings and text, I get the title and then the content. So headings and text, that's important. And then make sure to include any text as part of an image. And going back to what uh, Seska said earlier, it's best practice to not have text be part of an image, but sometimes it's not, it's, it's unavoidable, right? You might have a, a picture of a road sign and people need to know what the, what the sign says. So you wanna include that text as part of an image in your description. And then any text on the slide, paragraphs, bullet points, whatever you have. Descriptions of images, certainly the information from the alternative text, the information that would go in the caption. So this goes back to the kind of the same concepts as um, what, what you'd put on the web page, very similar. But then you also want to think about relationships between text and images. So why is the image there and what does it have to do with the text? Is the text talking about something in the image? Is the image an example of something in the text? How do the two fit together? And then any action that, that occurs when you click the image, maybe that image is gonna be a link so that when people are um, you know, using these slides later, um, that might take them to the web page where the image came from. All of these are important. And I think we're moving, yep. So um, we have some tips for presentations coming up. Um, first thing, if you're thinking, oh gosh, where do I start? This is too much. Well, the first thing first is to go through your slides, find all the places you have images. And remember, this is any type of image, could be a logo, could be a map. Write the alternative text for your images first and add it to the slides. That way, when you're finishing your slides, you won't be worrying that you've missed a piece of alt text. So that, you know, never mind the visual description for your own peace of mind, do your alternative text as you're planning all this out. Um, and including that in your slides for people who are viewing them later, people navigating through with a screen reader. Then once you have the alternative text first, only then start to think about what else do I need to explain that's not directly in the image. Captions are a great place. We talked about captions, but if it's longer, maybe it's someone um, churning butter, an old painting of someone churning butter. And you wanna talk about the artist, you wanna talk about the, the type of, of paint and style they used, when was it made, and then how people actually churn butter. That should probably be paragraphs because it's a lot for a caption. So think about what do you want to do there? Then put the information in a logical order. Does it make more sense for your presentation to describe the photo first? It's a woman in a sunbonnet churning butter, painting of a woman in a sunbonnet churning butter. Or does it help to talk about you know, all the content, the artist? The materials, churning butter, and then say, you also have an image, it's a painting of a woman in a sunbonnet churning butter. 
that depends on your presentation and feel free to try it out a couple different ways, see what flows better. Speaking of which, practice your presentation with the descriptions. Make sure you get all the text and images together. Okay, it might help to, to go a slide at a time. It might help to go a topic, topic at a time, but just give yourself some time to work through audio description if you're new or a visual description if you're new to it um, so that you can prep before you're actually giving this presentation. Um, when you're practicing, the second, second um, slide of tips here, when you're practicing, what if you notice that those slides are feeling too wordy when you describe and it feels uncomfortable, it feels clunky, what can you do? Well, the first thing you can try is splitting those information dense slides into two or three shorter slides to give yourself a little more space as you describe. And also breaking information into manageable chunks. If it's not manageable for you, it's probably not manageable for your audience either. So breaking that information into manageable chunks also supports accessibility. It gives people more time to process that cognitive load. And then now that you've put all this work into your description, you wanna save it for later, right? You wanna keep, keep a record of that good description you just did. If you have an option to share a video of your presentation, that's great news because the description will be contained in the video from you presenting it. If you have the option to share only the presentation slides, make sure that each image in, in the slides is correctly described. People will be able to pick up the text with a screen reader. They can zoom in and out and magnify, but that image description with the alt text um, and, and any other information is also gonna really help there. We think we have one more slide of tips for presentations. This is a good question. And this is something that has come up within Nobility and also in plenty of other settings. Should speakers visually describe themselves? So when I, at the beginning said, well, I'm a white woman in my mid thirties. I talked about my hair, my glasses, um, my big earrings. Should I say that or should I skip it? Well, the answer is that's up to you. Everyone has a different preference. There's arguments for and against based on you know, how people feel about these descriptions. Um, some people feel like it's superfluous, but some people feel like it can be useful to help share information about the speakers. And that can serve several purposes. Um, sometimes people want to talk about, and this comes up frequently talking about race and ethnicity. Sometimes people want to, you know, say, hey, I'm a person of color. And that's part of, of their, their voice weighing in on a particular issue, lived experience as a person of color. And including that in the description of themselves can support that. Um, sometimes it might introduce something uh, fun about a person to lighten up the mood. I'm in a really boring office right now. There's a blank white wall behind me, but um, you know, maybe I had a, an interesting piece of artwork on my wall or a silly picture or something that I could share as, as something you know, just fun. Um, or sometimes it, it might introduce something about me to give me some credibility. If I was talking about buying your first pair of glasses and and I describe that I'm wearing glasses, you know, I might have some extra credibility um, in my conversation because I've obviously bought a pair of glasses. But then some people don't want that description. So it's really up to you. And then next, what if you have a slide with a video? How do you talk about that? Or how do you bring that in with description? Well, the first thing to ask yourself is, do you have the option for participants to access an audio described version of that video you want to share? Can you include it? Um, can you share it with people? Can you make it available? If not, you might need to make your own version of the audio description available. So whether that's, you know, if you're making your own video, you might bring in the audio description. 
or um, you might give a little description before. You know, this is what's in the video for context, if, if that's not available. And then describe the video's relationship to other components on the page. You know, where the video is kind of a space in the page or space in the slide, similar to how you might describe a photograph. Not that it's a static image, but you might just you might have the video before a certain piece of text or after this visual component. So think about where you might position it, like how you might position a photograph. Here's some tips for images here uh, before we move on. If you're struggling with how to write alt text, um, one really good piece of advice that was given to me was think, how would you describe the image over the phone? If you were describing the image to someone on the phone who couldn't see it, um, what would you need to describe within the image? What, what's a you know, good summary of the image? And then also think, you know, how does the image fit in with the other information on the page or slide? If it's an image of, um, and I'll always remember this, when I was learning how to write alt text, my coworker at the time, Nick Steenhout, um, gave me a picture of a man skiing on a, on a sit ski, which is an adaptive um, ski for people who use a wheelchair. And he's skiing down the hill and he said, how would you describe this photo? And I said, well, I'm a little stuck because I don't know is this something from a, a ski company that offers adaptive skiing classes? Is this man, a, a, you know, is he a competitive skier? Is this, you know, his, is he, did he write a book and this is just a fun picture of him skiing that is on his author website? And he said, yes, it could be any of those. You have to, you have to find the context. So maybe there's something important about um, that image that I really want to make sure is in that description. For example, if I run a skiing lesson company and we now offer adaptive skiing lessons for people learning to use a sit ski, I want to say, man skiing down a hill on a sit ski. So it depends on what the context is. We can move on. Oh, wait, no, we can't. Sorry, I've got two more resources on this slide. I got too excited. Um, and these are good, this is good. So I do wanna stay here. Um, the first thing I wanna talk about is just to remind you, like all of our previous Be a Digital Allies, you can go back and review our Be a Digital Ally on alternative text. It's linked in the slide. We have a transcript, we have a video. Um, also the Web Accessibility Initiative, tutorials on image description. Those are excellent. They have examples and procedures and tutorials for all those different types of images that we talked about. So I highly recommend checking that out if you're getting stuck on how to write for a particular type of image. Now we can move on. Sorry, Jay. All right, so we're gonna practice. I have some different examples of situations where you might need to apply image description. And I wanna see what we think here. So. The first one we're going to do is visual description of a digital slide, not this slide. I want to know how you provide a visual description of the next slide. It's very confusing to have the instructions and then the slide, so I made them two separate. So we're going to go on to the next slide. And I'm going to um, hold off. The, the slide is up. I'm not describing it just yet. Um, I, I want to, to give you guys a few seconds to think while I'm, while I'm talking here. I will describe it, and then um, we're going to go on to the next slide after that, and then um, talk about some of the points that were in my description, if that makes sense. So, um, so it's, 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 it's very hard to, to hold off and not describe the slide after I've been talking about it. So we'll give everybody about 30 seconds. If you have things that you think need to be included in the Please description, go ahead that. and put them in chat and then we'll discuss as we chat. describe. 
Oh, they've been chatting away about all kinds been of good chatting stuff. Chatting away. Ah. Yes, the the um, character count limit for alt text. I heard 400 absolutely max, but that is a lot. That is a lot. Okay, I'm getting some great descriptions coming in, talking about the image. I'm going to start describing the slide. Feel free to keep the descriptions coming as I as I talk. All right, so we're on to our next slide, which is volcanoes in Hawaii. So the Hawaiian islands were created millions of years ago by volcanic activity. And in fact, two of the world's most active volcanoes, Kilauea and Mauna Loa are located in Hawaii. Um, and when they erupt, they're still erupting today, they change the geology of the islands. And we have um, an image here of Mauna Loa. It happens to be in the process of erupting right now. It's shooting out some bright orange lava. And this is from its last major eruption, which was on April 3rd, 1984. And this is courtesy of the National Park Service. All right, so I see some good, oh, good question. Is it smoke or clouds? That's, this gets a little bit, uh, so in, in the picture of the volcano, it looks like there's some, some cloudy vapors around it. I thought it was steam. Uh, from the water, but but I could be wrong too. I think that might be a best guess situation, pouring down the side of the volcano. So these are great descriptions of the image, but one thing I want to really highlight here is that we're talking about the whole slide too, and that all of the slide is really functioning together like one big image. It sounds some, like some research would be required for that detail. I agree. I'm probably going to be looking it up this evening because I'm curious. So I included in my description of the slide, I included the heading, Volcanoes in Hawaii. There's text on the slide. There's an image caption about when it erupted. Um, and then I described the image. So my alt text, which was an image, is volcano erupting, shooting bright orange lava from the top. But I liked the person who said it's actually flowing down the side as well. That fits in really nicely with the context about changing geology, actually. And then I had my information source. So I want to make sure all my text and images were included together in that description. And it takes a little practice. It really does. I've had to learn this, too. All right, we're going to move on to our next practice. Um, again, I'm going to hold off on describing and kind of dragging up my, my intro just a little bit. Um, but if you have some ideas of what this complex image represents, um, feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, you know, take some time, think about it. And in just a little bit, I'm going to start describing the image and then feel free to keep the descriptions coming while I start my description. And then we're gonna touch on some of the main points on the next um, next slide. So I'll get into my description now. So we have here um, a number of U.S. households who keep pets. Um, it's a it's a bar graph of the number of different types of pets represented in these different households. So um, the the total number of U.S. households with pets is eighty four point nine million. And then we're gonna, we have a breakdown by pet. So dogs uh, at 63.4 million, cats at 42.7 million, freshwater fish at 11.5 million. And then we have birds at 5.7 million, reptiles of all types together at 4.5 million, horses at 1.6 million, saltwater fish tie with horses at 1.6 million, and then other types of pets grouped together at 5.4 million, and this comes from spots.com, which is a, a pet owner information website. Um, so I have a question, Erica. Yeah. So if I'm doing this presentation and I don't necessarily, my purpose of the slide is not so we know every single number, mm -hmm. but yeah. maybe I'm trying to highlight something specific. 
that might be something else to think about in terms of how you are presenting this information in that visual description. Yes, and I want us to go on to the next slide because we will talk about just that. Jessica's backing me up tonight. So I'm gonna, I have two different types of descriptions and I see some great, um, great feedback here. Kelly, I want to, um, to get back to what you said about an HTML table um, in just a minute. Um, so keep that in mind. Bar chart, this is great. Uh, sharing the data, absolutely. So I'm doing this in two different ways. I've written out the alt text for this whole uh, bar graph. Basically, as I said it before, it's the number of US households with the pets, the 84.9 million households with pets, and then all the information about the dogs, the cats, freshwater fish, and horses, et cetera. Um, and I'm not reading out the full description because I just read it, um, but it is the same information. Um, but then, just like Jessica said, this is, this is a lot. It's a complex image for a reason, it's complex. So what do we do if we want to give people the option to kind of skip over that whole long thing? If you are putting this on your website and you want to do just that, what you can do is you have the option to give a short description as long as you are doing that in combination with the full longer alt text, right? So this could be, um, and the way I did it here was as, as a short alt text with option for longer. Um, my alt text is bar graph showing the number of US households keeping pets, full description at, and I'd put a link there with that full long description. This is easiest to do if you are if you are a coder. You can do this all in HTML. And if you're thinking, Erica, I'm not a coder, what do I do? You could make a short caption. You could take even that, that title of the graph, maybe crop it out. Make that the caption, US households keeping pets, right? Or bar graph of US households keeping pets full description at, put the link in the text of the page if you're using a, like a block editor or something like that. That is an option. Now, what if my short description, what if my whole presentation or my whole page, if I'm making a web page, is talking about how popular dogs are in the US. And I really wanna talk about dogs and how great they are, right? They are pretty great. I could pull out a relevant detail from that graph if it supports a short description and I want to include it. So I could say, you know, bar graph showing the number of US households with keeping pets. Dogs are the most popular pet at 63.4 million households. That could, that could really support my argument here or why it's so important to talk about dogs. You can do that too. But again, that depends on the context. I'm gonna go pretty quickly through this last one. Uh, and Kelly, that is an excellent resource. Thank you so much, Jack. Um, again, that tutorial has several really good examples of complex images. I would start with that section first, um, for sure. Uh, and then, oh, and what Kelly said about the HTML table, that can, that can be a great asset to have in your um, um, full out description. That's a great way to display all that information. And in the tutorial, they do show just that. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up. This last one is a group of images. I'm gonna go pretty quick. So start I would say go ahead and just, yeah, I was gonna say, just, just go ahead it, and do the description. Yeah, because I wanna give us like, Five minutes, <laughs> sorry y'all. Um, so this is edible plants native to Texas. And I have uh, three different types here. I have a photo of a purple passion flower. It is indeed very purple. And it has these curly thread-like petals. I also have its Latin name, if you are into Latin names, Passiflora incarnata, it's a great Latin name. And then we're moving on to the agerita, which is kind of a, a shrubby plant with long 
stems. It's they and they're really covered in green leaves, small green leaves, and some round red berries. And the Latin name of that adjurita plant is Mahonia trifoliolata. I had to practice one a few that one a few times. And then last but not least, we have the meadow garlic. So this is a, a small plant with green stalks, and each stalk has a you know, you know it by the little cluster of white flowers at the top. Um, this is Allium canadense, those playing along at home. Um, but before we move on, I have a really important safety first notice for everyone who is interested in foraging for wild plants, edible plants. Do not eat wild plants unless you're absolutely sure what they are and what part is edible. So might just be the roots, might just be the leaves. Very important to check first and go with a trusted source. And all of these wonderful photos came from the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. We can move right along to the next one. This one had a lot. Um, this one had the heading, the, um, the purple patch flower caption, describe the image. Same for the adjurita, the caption, describe the image. The meadow garlic, um, describe the image. And I described the image using the alt text that I shared. So um, I, I will read them out. Actually, purple passion flower, purple flower with the curly uh, thread-like petals. The adjurita is the stem with the, um, the green leaves covering it, the round red berries. And then the meadow garlic is green stock with white flowers. And then I had my safety notice in my source. Happy snacking, don't die. I like that. All right, so we're gonna move on to some good resources here to close this out. All right, um, so these are just some resources. Again, um, the other resources in the slides as well. And we will have, um, if you didn't get a chance to download the slides, we'll make sure that they are up on the website. Um, within a, a couple days. Uh, but of course, we have our friends at W3 talking about low vision uh, video descriptions. Again, 3Play Media had a, a nice training on audio description, um, ArtSpark, um, guidelines and best practices for describing educational videos is a really great link as well. Um, and then again, the, the audio digital project, we, we gave you a link that was just taking them to vendors, but also just their whole uh, library of information. All right, so um, we've been having some good questions in chat. I know we had gotten an email. Uh, let me see if I can pull it up without completely collapsing the screen. Um, but if somebody wants to kind of um, talk about that a little bit while I pull it up, if, or if somebody else has the email yeah. up. I, I thought that was a really interesting one, and I, I came up with how I would do it um, as we pull it up. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe the image. It was a map of um, several countries in the Middle East, and it was showing different territories, if I remember correctly, that were occupied by sort of different kingdoms over time. And the context was um, a history lesson, world history lesson, and how do you audio describe these images? And so the first question, oh, here we are. Oh, thank you, Jessica. Um, the, the first question, question is, should we use the, the countries to describe the spaces that were occupied by these different, um, in these different time periods? And my answer was yes, because even though there's no text, although I would say adding some text here could help contextualize the map, maybe for students who are trying to match the country with its name by shape. Um, the, the country is indicated by the border. So I would say yes, that using the countries would be a great way to contextualize what these territories are. The second question was, should we use the names of the countries as they are now or what these countries were called at the time of these um, expansions, at the time of these um, governments? That's a really excellent question. And that's definitely important information but there is no cue directly from this image that says what these territories were called at these different times. I would put that in additional text on the slide or the page, what they were called just to support that um, part of the learning process. But 
I don't think of that as associated with the image. So that was a really excellent question. And thank you for sharing the map and your questions with us. Okay, ah, there we go. Um, so we are wrapping up. Thank you very much. We, we know this was a really dense um, session today. Uh, so we do have a, a survey for you to take. So if you want to go onto our bit.ly, so it is bit.ly slash June Bada. It is all capital letters. So J-U-N-E-B-A-D-A. -A. Um, and we would love for you to do that. So if one of my lovely teammates can put that in chat for me uh, as I go to our next slide, which is our K-12 Access Summit. Oh, I forgot to increase the font on that. Um, this is our annual uh, education virtual conference. We're really excited about it this year. Um, we've got some great presenters and content. Um, for more information, you can just go to nobility.org slash K-12 Access. Um, this is a free virtual conference. We had um, some lovely donations and sponsors because they know that this was important to get it out to our teachers. And again, if you would like to be a part of um, helping those programs, you know, going to our donation page, um, contacting us at sponsorship at nobility.org. Uh, we would love to have you be a part of that as well. All right, so last uh, note of slides here is of course, join us. Oh, and I have the date wrong on here, apologies. Um, we have our next uh, BATA coming up on uh, July. It'll be July 21st, so it'll be that Thursday. Um, and you will be able to get all the links and information at nobility.org slash digital ally. And that'll be a capital D and a capital A. Um, we will get the um, June video up, uh, hopefully fairly soon, soon. We hope to have it up by the end of the month. Um, that way you can catch all that information. And then when we move into to part two, you'll be ready to go. So thank you all. Um, we love doing these. We hope you learned a lot. The chat was great today. Um, I've got lots and lots of resources for, for myself to steal and make sure um, I get to put it in there. So uh, 